Welcome. And thank you for joining us for this week's Ask the Experts workshop. I am Dr. Pamela Herstella Pietra, President and Founder of Children and Screens, Institute of Digital Media and Child Development, and host of this popular weekly series. Children and Screens is a leading convener, funder, and curator of scientific research and public educator on the topic of digital media and child development. Today's workshop will explore potential threats to your family's online privacy, what is being done to protect children's digital data, and what parents can do to help. Our esteemed panelists will cover everything from phishing attacks to the routine collection of personal information by social media companies and others, and will offer practical tips for combating these issues as a family. Our panelists have reviewed the questions you submitted and will answer as many as possible during their presentations. If you have additional questions during the workshop, please type them into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen and indicate whether or not you'd like to ask your question live on camera or if you prefer that the moderator read your question. Please know that we may not be able to answer all of your questions, but we'll address as many as time permits. We are recording today's workshop and hope to upload a video to YouTube in the coming days. Tomorrow, you'll receive a link to our YouTube channel where you'll find videos from our past webinars as well. It is now my great pleasure to introduce our moderator, Dr. Sonia Livingstone. Dr. Livingstone is a professor at the London School of Economics and Political Science and an international expert on children's internet safety, privacy and rights in the digital environment. Welcome, Sonia. Thank you, Pam, and uh, welcome uh, to everyone who's participating in this webinar and to uh, our exciting uh, speakers today. I've, um, uh, children are encountering such complex technological innovation uh, these days, which brings all kinds of risks and opportunities. And I think it's only recently that we have really begun paying attention to the question of privacy. But as we know, everything children do today online is in some ways the subject of processes of data collection. What they do is in some ways collected, tracked, um, monetized in, in where, various ways according to a complex data ecology, which today's speakers are going to tell you about. I myself am a researcher. I spend a lot of time with children at home and in school. So that's kind of my, my perspective on these dilemmas. And uh, the research I've done and the research I've read has given me a very clear sense of the dilemmas and the uh, uncertainties that I know parents are facing um, uh, in, in the United States, um, in my country, Britain, in many, many parts of the world. What we also know from research is that children and families really do care about their privacy uh, online and in a digital world, and they want to have the chance to decide what information of theirs is shared and with whom, uh, and parents care about these issues um, as, as do children. But these are really complex and difficult issues to understand, especially now that children use the internet so very early in their lives, uh, and especially now that increasingly everything is getting connected. I also see from research that very often um, children and parents think about questions of going online in terms of safety, in terms of the risk to their person. And so it can be puzzling to understand um, how online activities are generating data and that our likes and our searches and our visits are all tracked and that that information gets sold. I've seen in my own research that um, when children understand something of this data ecology, they find it creepy and in many ways they are outraged. And yet at the same time, they are puzzled because they're not quite sure what the harm is. It's not, it's not so easy to understand where the problem lies in relation to this enormous kind of marketplace of data uh, compared with some of the very real safety threats that people uh, feel and have become more familiar with. I know that parents are meant to protect and guide children, but uh, there's plenty of research that shows how parents are both concerned but also confused and they too struggle to deal with all of those possible privacy options and questions that we're already 
and always being asked about, do you want to share this or do you want to allow uh, this or that um, uh, privacy setting? And I know parents feel unsupported in this dilemmas and difficulties that they face. So many different organizations, are, including uh, those representing parents and children, are now calling for information and they're calling for solutions. Solutions from business, solutions from government. And today, I think we'll both understand the situation for parents, but we'll also get a sense of what are the options available for businesses and for governments as they try to respect children's rights to privacy um, and to treat their, to, to just, we need to discover what are the, what are the possibilities for um, treating children's privacy and data more respectfully in this, in this digital age. So today we have five amazing speakers to help us address these issues and answer these questions and give us a better sense both of what parents can do, but also what are the challenges for um, governments and business. And I'm aware that there are likely to be, um, I'm sure there are parents listening to the webinar, but parents are sometimes also activists or lawyers, or they might also be in positions where they um, have some say over how children's data are treated. So we're going to try to provide ideas to um, inform everyone uh, uh, as, we, as we proceed in the next hour and a half. So I'm going to introduce each of our speakers in order and they'll, uh, they'll uh, make their presentation and then we'll have a question from the audience for each of our speakers so that we kind of break up the conversation and then I hope we'll also have time at the end to address uh, any additional questions. So first I'm going to introduce um, Dr. Serge Eagleman who is the research director of the Usable Security and Privacy Group at the International Computer Science Institute. And he leads the Berkeley Laboratory for Usable and Experimental Security at UC Berkeley. Dr. Eggelman's research focuses on the intersection of privacy, uh, computer security and human computer interaction with the specific aim of better understanding how people make decisions surrounding their privacy and security and creating data driven improvements to systems and interfaces. So Serge, the floor is yours. Thanks for the introduction. Um, yeah, I'm Serge Jagelman. Um, I actually uh, don't have the background with children. Uh, my background is in computer science and I look at human factors to understand how people make privacy and security decisions. Um, one of the things that my research group has been doing uh, recently has been doing a lot on tracking on the, the mobile app ecosystem. So I was going to just walk through about some of how some of this actually happens. So when you have a, a mobile app, um, there are several different what we call persistent identifiers and a persistent identifier is just a unique number that can identify you and your device, similar to say the license plate on your car. So there are lots of different uh, these unique identifiers that can be used and frequently are. So, you know, when your app, you know, apps on your device uh, contact other, you know, servers on the internet, they will share these identifiers. And so let's look, look, take a look at how this works. So imagine you're playing uh, an app, Angry Birds, uh, your phone sends the serial number to uh, an advertiser, and that includes the name of the app. So now that, that that app knows that the phone with this serial number plays Angry Birds. And so you can imagine, you know, over a time as this one third party, this Acme advertising receives data from lots of different apps that allows them to tie lots of different behaviors to, you know, you as an individual. So, you know, if you play Angry Birds, Twitter and speed car racing on your phone, uh, Acme advertising receives, you know, that information and then you know, uses that to decide what are the ads that are probably most likely to be clicked on or interacted with by the type of person who plays Angry Birds, uses Twitter, and, and plays speed car racing. Um, and so all of this happens automatically pretty much whenever you use apps. Um, and they use this data to make inferences about, you know, the, the types of things that, that are likely to motivate you, your dem demographics, and so forth. And it's all in the name of uh, trying to increase the odds that you'll either make purchases inside the app, uh, continue using the app for longer because it's, you know, intentionally made to be addictive, and therefore you're more, more likely to either 
make in-app purchases or click ads the longer you play it. Um, but you know, the problem is, you know, many of these companies receiving the data are augmenting the data from lots of different sources. So, you know, uh, every machine on the internet has an IP address, which is another type of unique identifier. So in this case, Acme advertising, you know, might contact another data broker and says, you know, and say, Hey, I just received some traffic that has this particular serial number. Does anyone know any more about this user? And so then, you know, a data broker might respond and say, oh, on the internet, you know, previously I saw someone with this IP address we, because they filled out a, a form on a website. We know that they're also, you know, they reside at this physical you know, address and here's some other web traffic that we associate with this IP address. Um, you know, another data broker might have another persistent identifier that matches the device. Um, and so forth. And so in this manner, uh, you know, a third party can, you know, use these different data sources, the apps directly, as well as other third parties, to aggregate a lot of information about individual users. And all of this happens pretty much, you know, opaquely without you knowing when or if it's even occurring. Uh, in about 2013, 2014, because this, you know, started to become more and more of a, a pervasive problem, uh, to step back, I mean, this type of tracking occurs on the internet too. This isn't, you know, unique to mobile apps. What's unique to mobile apps is that there are a lot more persistent identifiers to choose from. On the web, it's generally cookies, which are another type of persistent identifier that are stored in your browser. All current web browsers allow you to periodically clear your cookies, and that's, you know, that allows, you know, companies to essentially stop tracking you most of the time. Um, but that, that didn't exist on mobile apps. And so both Google and Apple created a new identifier called the advertising ID and by policy, they mandated that any third parties that are going to track users for advertising and profiling purposes need to only use this one identifier, which users can reset, um, similar to clearing your cookies in the browser. And so, you know, this is how this works. Instead, you know, the, the app contacts the advertising company and says, you know, this ad ID is playing Angry Birds. Um, the problem with this, of course, is that, you know, if, if they, you know, well, sorry, uh, stepping back again. So, you know, with the ad ID, the user might decide that, you know, they don't want to be tracked anymore. And, you know, you can go then and reset the ad ID. Um, in theory, what would happen then is, you know, the advertiser will say, oh, well, we've never seen this ad ID before because it's brand new and therefore we can't, you know, tie this to an existing profile. But the problem is if that's sent alongside other you know, at, you know, identifiers that they can't be reset that negates the whole purpose of this privacy interface. <clears throat> and so another question that I get from, you know, a, a lot of parents is, you know, how can I make sure that my apps, you know, that, that apps from my child are, are, are safe, that, you know, obey the various privacy settings that don't collect lots of additional identifiers and so forth. And, you know, the, the answer is, you know, it's simple. You just need to instrument the Android permission, you know, protected uh, APIs, uh, disassemble app binaries, and perform deep packet inspection. Uh, this, is, of course, is a joke, um, but this is, you know, the technical process that, that one must follow if one wants to answer this question, because the tools don't exist for the average user to figure out the uh, privacy implications. Instead, what we have is the notice and consent framework, which basically just means read a privacy policy. And so let's look at how that works. If I'm going to download an app from the, you know, from the Play Store, I can scroll to the bottom and know that there's a link here for the privacy policy. Um, and yeah, and then I can click that and I, I get this privacy policy and it's just really a matter of reading it um, to figure out what, what, what's happening. Simple, huh? So the point is, you know, these have been studied actually over a, a long time. This is the only tool that consumers have to make decisions about privacy, the, the privacy policy. And, you know, a study 10 years ago showed that, you know, this is completely unreasonable for most consumers. So this policy um, is from TikTok. Um, at the time that I took this screenshot, it was, you know, over 5,000 words. It's written at, you know, a high school reading level. The average reader in the U.S. would take more than 20 minutes to read it. Um, there was a study 10 years ago, you know, showing that basically if you were to read all the privacy policies that you encounter when interacting, you know, with the web, uh, it, this would basically be a full-time job for several months. Um, obviously, in the past 12 years, this problem's probably gotten worse due to the prolifer uh, proliferation of online services, but, you know, it illustrates the point. Um, the last point I was going to make, because um, I'm at the end of my time, is just, you know, one of the questions that consumers are really interested in is, what about third parties? So usually, if you want to read a privacy policy, it's probably because you want to figure out, is this company going to share your data? And if so, with, with whom? Um, and so, you know, going through the framework, the app privacy policies often say the data will be shared with various 
third parties, but don't actually name them. Um, and you know the, the theory there is well, those third parties have their own privacy policies, and you can you know you can just find the third parties. The problem is you know unless you're decompiling the app or inspecting traffic, you have no idea who the third parties are, and therefore can't reasonably go and locate their privacy policies. And there's nothing in the CCPA or GDPR in Europe that actually corrects this. Um, other speakers are probably going to are going to be talking about this a little more, but there's there's no requirement that companies actually name the third parties that are going to be receiving data. So, you know, to wrap this up, my group has been doing a lot of research. Um, we, we have our own build of Android. We're doing some stuff on iOS now, too, where we've instrumented phones and we just run apps to see what they do. Um, we put together um, a service, uh, App Census. We've since spun this out as a startup. Um, we're doing work for regulators, but we also have a free database online where, you know, you can search uh, for, you know, the behaviors of free apps. The, the database online is, is out of date right now, but we're aware of that and are planning to get back to that in the next few months. Um, we briefly looked at, you know, COPPA compliance, which others are going to talk about. Um, COPPA has, you know, in, in the U.S. is the only real, you know, comprehensive privacy uh, law that, that impacts children. Um, and there are, you know, requirements about, you know, per, personal information requiring, you know, parental consent before it's collected. Same thing with, you know, conducting behavioral advertising. Uh, behavioral advertising. There are strict requirements for what actually counts as parental consent. Um, and then data that is transmitted must have reasonable security measures. And we find that, you know, by and large, most apps that are specifically targeted at children are, don't appear to be, you know, following the law here. Um, and, you know, worse, parents have really no way of knowing. Um, there, there's industry, you know, for, for 20 years now, there have been, you know, uh, pushes for industry self-regulation. There's, uh, there are programs where there's, you know, apps are certified as being COPPA compliant by, you know, these um, private entities. Um, but by and large, we find that these certifications uh, aren't really useful um, because the apps that appear to be certified don't appear to be doing anything better in terms of privacy than apps that aren't certified. And so that's why my conclusion is that this is firmly a policy problem. You know, technology alone yeah. just doesn't solve this. Thank you. Thank you, Serge. Um, that was a very um, actually rapid fire, but really, um, I think, insightful account of just what goes on when you, when you, when you uh, use an app or you sign up to a new service. Um, and one thing that really struck me from uh, what, you, what you're saying um, is uh, you, you presented as parents deciding and parents, you know, reading the, the privacy. I'm sorry, I'm from London. I say privacy. Well, we'll you'll get over it. Um, the privacy policies. Um, but of course, very often it's the child who is, who is um, saying yes to the privacy policies or signing up to the app. And I know in um, Europe, in relation to our general data protection regulation, and I think also in the US, in relation to copper, there's been a very kind of lively debate at various points in time about um, just how much um, children can decide and up to what age it might be appropriate for parents to take that responsibility. And then at what point we say, okay, the children are now ready to kind of make their decisions. And what's, what's so extraordinary um, from the reading the terms and conditions and recognizing the decisions to be made is that you know there is no age at which even adults can really understand the situation that they face so the idea that somewhere around about 13 children get it is um uh i know this is why um uh, the regulations are being reviewed and i think um some of the other speakers are going to going to address this but i do think it's um um, from the point of view of families, it raises some interesting questions also about the dynamic within the family and when it is and how it is that parents kind of manage the environment for their children's app use and device use and at what point they say, okay, you're, you're on your own, you're ready to go. Um, I think that's something very much um, a challenge that parents face. Um, and that um, uh, takes us to a question that we have. I think we have Pallavi Shah here who's going to um, ask Serge um, a question. And uh, Pallavi, thank you and uh, welcome. Thank you for the seminar and having me here. My question is that given the nature of internet, um, I think we are leaving um, cookie crumbs everywhere. So is privacy even possible? 
Sure. I, 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 yeah, you know, absolutely. I mean, there are a lot of, you know, we have the technology. <laughs> um, you know, there's, you know, various, you know, technologies that, that could solve many of these problems in, in terms of, you know, the, the, you know, protecting the identifiers from being transmitted to begin with or using various encryption techniques so that, you know, even if the data is collected, it's not useful for other purposes, you know, beyond the, the purpose of collection. The problem is, you know, for, you know, someone needs to adopt these technologies and use them and that requires, you know, investment deciding that, you know, it's worth paying the money to, you know, change our tooling to better handle privacy. Um, but right now, those, in, you know, incentives for companies to do that don't exist, right? And that's why, you know, I think this is a, you know, fundamentally a policy issue. Um, you know, it's the role of policy to create the incentives for the companies to, to you know, handle this, you know, responsibly. So, Thank you. Thank you for the question. And um, actually, uh, Serge's answer takes us very um, neatly, I think, to our next um, speaker, because in the policy um, world, of course, there are the regulators and the state, but there are also those who are um, working on behalf of civil society uh, to try to bring about change and to respect um, uh, people's um, privacy in, in new ways. So uh, in that context, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Angela Campbell, our next speaker. Um, Angela chairs the board of the Campaign for a Commercial Free Childhood and is Professor Emeritus at Georgetown Law Center. And for over 30 years, she's directed a clinical program at Georgetown University Law Center that worked to protect children's privacy, promote quality children's content and prevent unfair and deceptive marketing to children. Thank you. Thank you, um, Sonia and Serge, both of you for a great introduction. Um, let me get this corrected. Um, so I'm going to give you information about the one children's privacy law that we have at the federal level in the United States. And it's important to note, as, as Serge did, that we don't have a general privacy law. Adults don't have these same protections, only children do, and only children that are under age 13. So the way this works, uh, I'll give you a little more detail than Serge did, is that it prohibits the collection, use, or disclosure of a child's personal information um, by a website or online service, unless the operator notifies the parents about what personal information is collected, how it is used, and with whom it is shared, and gives both direct notice to parents and posts an online privacy policy that's supposed to be easy to find and easy to understand, and they have to obtain verifiable parental consent before they collect any information from the child. Um, it also gives parents a right to review and to stop for any further use of their child's personal information, and it prohibits conditioning a child's participation on disclosing more information than necessary. Operators are required to protect the confidentiality and security of data, and they may not retain the data uh, longer than necessary. But in fact, uh, this sounds great, but there's a big enforcement problem. Um, parents have no right and children have no right to sue to enforce the law. Only the Federal Trade Commission and the state's attorneys generals have the ability to bring enforcement actions. And these are very small, generally, organizations with lots of responsibilities. And in the last 20 years, since the rules has taken effect, the FTC has only brought 34 cases. And all of those cases have been settled. And states have brought even fewer cases. Now, in addition to just the lack of enforcement, um, the copy itself has a lot of limitations. Uh, I've already mentioned it doesn't protect, do, provide any protections for children over the age of 12. Another important um, limitation is that it doesn't apply to all websites or online services that are used by children. It only applies in one of two circumstances. The uh, service is directed to children, or the operator of the service has actual knowledge that the user is a child. And I'm gonna talk just about the first one because we don't have time. Um, 
So what does it mean to say something's directed at children? Well, the FTC's provided guidance that says these are the factors that we're going to look at. Well, it's a whole bunch of factors and no one is determinative. And so it's very subjective and you can't just look at a service necessarily and say, oh, clearly this is child directed because someone else might look at it and say, no, it's not. So, um, so I'm going to illustrate why this is a problem by using an example. Let's say you, you have a, a daughter, an eight-year-old that, that loves Barbie and you're looking for a game for her. So you go to the Google Play Store and there's lots of games to choose from. And let's say you choose the second one, which is Barbie Fashion Closet by Mattel. And you go and you read the description. Um, it looks, doesn't say anything about whether it's intended for children or not. It says it's for everyone. So then you go and you're a really diligent parent. You go and you read the privacy policy. Um, which search showed you how to find and in this case the privacy policy is a little under 2,000 words But it's still pretty and written at a 12th grade level um, It's uh, and you have to read the whole this really just part of the privacy policy. So you have to also read the rest of the privacy policy to really understand it um, And you won't understand it anyhow because they use language Terms that aren't defined people don't know what they mean, but let me give you just one example they say, this is in the second paragraph, that they take special precautions to protect the privacy of children at Mattel Services directed to children. So that sounds good, right? Okay, but how do you know if it's directed to children? So they send, later say, if you have a question about whether a particular Mattel service is directed to children, please use the child-directed website request form. Now, I know most parents aren't going to do this, but I tried. I submitted my request yesterday morning and I still have not heard anything back from them. Um, so th this bit goes into another problem that again, Serge touched on, is that the whole way COPPA is set up is based on parents being the gatekeeper, parents reading the notices, understanding them, and making rational decisions about the, the risks and benefits. This really places an unrealistic burden on busy parents, on any parents. And we really, none of us really had, had the knowledge to really understand and assess the risks because the whole process that's going on behind the scenes is not transparent. Um, and it also, it's very hard for anyone to keep up with the rapidly changing technology and marketing practices. And even for regulators, it's difficult for them to do that. In 2013, the Federal Trade Commission did amend the COPPA rules and in some very important ways, but those rules are already out of date and they're currently considering additional changes. However, some changes will require new laws, which I think Jeff is gonna talk about next. So if you'd like more information or have to know how to get involved, I encourage you to visit our website at commercialfreechildhood.org. Thank you. Brilliant, thank you very much, um, Angela. And um, I, it's slightly, um, it, well, it is depressing to, to hear your dissection of the key law, which is um, there to protect children's um, privacy in the US. And in fact, um, in many countries around the world, because so many companies are headquartered in the US that they follow copper regulation, even when they are applying in um, my country or in many other countries. So it is a very important um, law and it is very um, uh, worrying then when we see the, the, the difficulty. Um, I, I, we, we have a question from the audience, which in a way kind of intensifies the challenge because I think um, as implied by the idea of a commercial free childhood, some some parents might want to uh, run away and say, "I don't, I don't want any of this." You know, let's let's keep my child free of um, so many of these kind of commercial platforms. And yet, as as somebody in the audience has asked, in the age of COVID, um, children are on their screens even more than before, and often young children are under the the, the copper age of thirteen as well as as older. So the, the screen has become uh, really crucial for their education and for their um, communication and their connection with the world. And it isn't just the um, 
uh, the, the businesses, but it's also the school. I mean, the school, you know, children, parents are wondering, uh, and another question, whether, um, whether one can say no to Zo the Zoom classroom or the, you know, the data protection, the, the, the data collection that goes on with that. So COVID makes it all much harder. Um, how, how, do you, how do we balance? How do we achieve balance? Well, it is hard. Uh, and obviously mm -hmm. a lot depends on the family situation and the age of the children. Um, schools play a very important role here. They, in some cases, can give consent. And I've seen some of the consent forms they sent home to parents, and they're just as impenetrable as the worst um, privacy <laughs> policy I've seen. So uh, that's really hard. Obviously, your child needs and to be educated, if that's their only option, then you know don't feel don't beat yourself up about it as a parent. But I would look at others. I would look very carefully at like what what apps, what other websites are actually useful for my for help my kids. So if it's like they want to have a FaceTime with grandma, no problem. They want to do TikTok twenty, you know, half hour an hour a day and they're under 13, you're not supposed to be on TikTok and there's all kinds of scary stuff on TikTok. I would say that's something where the parent has to say, no, you know, you've spent, you know, all your hours so far on school, go outside and play, do something different. Um, and, and, you know, basically it's just being a good parent and, and doing what you can to make sure your child lives a balanced life. Yeah, thank you, thank you very much. So in the, um, in the preparation for this um, webinar, when, when the speakers met, we um, had a discussion among ourselves about really how much it is that parents can do and what um, responsibility can they take on and how much really must um, the responsibility lie with um, the regulators and the state and, and companies. Uh, and um, our next speaker is a very strong advocate uh, that more should be done. And so it's a great um, pleasure for me to um, introduce Jeff Chester, who is the executive director of the Center for Digital Democracy, a Washington DC nonprofit organization that advocates for citizens, consumers, and other stakeholders on digital privacy and consumer protections online. And Jeff is a well-renowned expert on and advocate for privacy in the digital world. So, Jeff. Thank you, Sonia, and thank you, uh, Pamela, and uh, your colleagues for inviting me and having this important panel. And I applaud all of you parents and others concerned about children who are viewing today, listening in today for being concerned and doing what you uh, can. Um, but I'll ask you to step back, which I'm sure you know you often do, and think about you know our responsibility as parents and responsibilities in terms of all the children in the in the United States, if not the world, because our system really helps determine what goes on around the world, as, as uh, Sonia said. And think about especially children from low-income homes and who are often children of color who don't really have the resources, can't afford the devices to protect their privacy. They are heavily targeted. Uh, here, and especially as the country becomes more diverse and these uh, important groups uh, are online even more. You know, uh, in, in many ways, uh, youth of color are uh, engaged in very advanced uses of these digital media and companies really take advantage of them. We need to come up with a, a set of, of, of practices and policies, legislation, regulation, and corporate uh, uh, good practices that protects all uh, children, but I, but I want to just say that I personally think it's very, very hard for a parent uh, to do. I mean, after all, I, I ultimately, you know, when I said to my daughter, there's no Barbies, we have a warehouse. <laughs> now she's grown up. We have a warehouse of Barbies, you know, so it's very, you know, hopefully you're better parents than I am, but it's very, very hard, I think, especially as others have said, me children, and this is part of the industry strategy, children are literally growing up and pa busy parents, just as I use the television, you know, to, so I could cook dinner, right, um, but, you know, uh, today, parents have to hand the mobile phone and, and, and to, the, to their kid oftentimes, I think so. So, but just think about what we're up against. We're up against streaming video. We're up against virtual games. We're up against smart toys and smart speakers. We're up against mobile phones and social media and artificial intelligence and machine learning and virtual reality. All these things now run by super smart computers that make decisions about you and your child in less than 20 milliseconds. What kind of person? 
how do you target them? Where are they located? What do they like? You know, how do we can get them to buy? How do we can get them to act? That system is operating 24 seven. And it's very, and it's becoming only more powerful. And I do think it's very hard for parents. I mean, I don't know how many of you, um, uh, you know, decline using, let's say, your discount coupons at the grocery store or the mobile discount coupons. Well, when you click into that discount coupon at the grocery store in the UK or in the United States, you know, you know, you don't know that, that information is being tied into information about your home, about whether there's children in the home, about what you stream, what you view. So you can be targeted on all your devices anytime, anywhere. That's the system that's been created. Now, back in, in and somebody, but I, I forgot to set the timer, so you better let me know when my time is up. Look, so when we, when, when this system first emerged back in the, in the mid 1990s, and we knew it was going to be the most powerful advertising marketing system ever made, um, uh, you know, we decided to, to regulate it. And, and working with Angela and other U.S. consumer groups, we got, and we were fought. The, uh, the president at the time, Clinton, opposed COPPA. Um, but we got the United States' only online privacy act passed, and that unfortunately, once you turn 13 in the United States, you have no more privacy. If you're under 12, you do have some privacy, and that's, and that's COPPA. And I just want to say something about COPPA here, because I do track the market. If you're under 12, you are not subjected to the kind of far-reaching data collection and tracking system that's been a, that's the dominant system in the United States and the world. You know, it's called programmatic. You're not part of that. Yes, they do track you, and yes, companies get away with things, and part of the problem is that up until recently, everybody gave Google, Facebook, and everybody else a free pass. But the fact of the matter is that the kind of techniques that are, that are tracking your child once they turn 13 and above and track us all are not uh, uh, as uh, powerful in the, in the youth market, that's been a tremendous, tremendous success. Because if we had not passed COPPA, in 19, which went into effect in 2000, and frankly, if we had not, working with Angela, if we had not gotten the rules in 2012 that took what the Europeans had created, for privacy protections and brought them to protect children, we never would have been able to win a case last year against Google YouTube, which is the most powerful platform targeting children in the United States and the world. And we forced them to admit something they were lying about, that they were in fact tracking children. And now as a result of this legislation and this law, there's no more data-driven advertising to, to, to directed to children on YouTube in the United States and throughout the world. I won't get into the details, but the legislation, the regulation, the advocacy, the public shaming, the exposure has helped create a system that can protect your child and children in the United States and, and around the world. Now, we have a real opportunity here. Is it this almost time? Or you're saying hello? We have a real, <laughs> we have a, <laughs> It's almost have, time, Jeff. <laughs> I know you do it. Do I have 30 seconds? Yeah. 30 seconds? Okay, so look, children's privacy has been a bipartisan issue in the United States. We would never have gotten COPPA without the late Senator John McCain. And, you know, we, we have Senator Hawley uh, and Senator Markey uh, introducing very effective uh, proposed legislation that would not only protect uh, uh, better children, but also uh, teens. And, and more and more Republicans and more and more Democrats agree. For example, they've, they've expressed the need to regulate TikTok. So we have an opportunity now, especially as the governments and the states go after Google and Facebook and work on their power and try to limit their power. We have an opportunity to create some rules of the road at the, at the national level, at the state level, at the corporate level to, to, to respect the interests of our children. And we hope that you will join us and all the groups on this uh, webinar mm -hmm. and support their work uh, because we can get mm -hmm. something done the next few years. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jeff. I mean, there are, there are several questions coming in. And one, I guess, is one that is often asked, I wonder, and what your thoughts are um, on whether, whether we're always behind the curve. Um, isn't policy always uh, too slow? The state is always too slow to act. Um, uh, isn't it, would it be better to be calling for better self-regulation by companies because they are the ones who know the, the leading edge of innovation? Look, it's, it's a very tough issue because, as you all know, these are very, very powerful interests, mm. and they give a lot of money to both political parties, which is one reason why we haven't had any success 
for the most part in the, mm -hmm. in the last few years. But we have reached a, 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 a transformative moment in the United States uh, since 2016. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and now you have members of both parties, very, very critical uh, for different reasons in part, uh, uh, very, very critical of uh, the, the Google and Facebook and Amazon and their data collection practices, et cetera. So there is a real opportunity now to get something done um, because now they're being attacked, not just for their privacy policies, which is what we've been doing. Now they're being attacked because they have become monopolists. And there is a political moment here to make some change, in part also just to say, taking advantage of the push that the Europeans are doing, like in the mm. UK with food marketing, taking it, this is a global system and we can mm. go after the companies in a global way. And that's one of the things that my colleagues at the Campaign for Commercial Free Childhood and CDD are doing with allies around the world. This is a global campaign to protect our children and I hope you will join us. I think um, it's, it's um, you, you've mentioned what's happening in Europe and uh, many things are happening in Europe and uh, um, other parts of the world, not always uh, all that we would hope for. Um, but I do think uh, parents and those listening might be um, interested to hear kind of other possible models, other ways of managing this, this data ecology than um, is, is currently uh, that... Um, dominating in, in the United States. And I know our next speaker actually will talk about what's happening specifically in California. Um, but I just wanted to mention um, in Britain, we have recently had what we uh, like to think of as a kind of um, field changing um, regulation, which is called the Age Appropriate Design Code, or it's actually now being dubbed the Children's Code, which um, in this country is a new statutory instrument about to come into force that um, promises to really put children's um, privacy and children's interests at the heart of data protection. So it's, it's very new and we're, we're, we're still waiting to, um, you know, we can't be sure how it's exactly going to work out, but it does address some of the points that you um, have variously raised as a concern. So one is that it provides a higher level of privacy to everyone under 18, not just those under 13. Um, and it um, provides various kind of protections in terms of default settings, that children's location could not be shared by default, and that it should be clear what location settings, what privacy settings are present. Um, there should be no behavioral advertising um, uh, for children and no kind of nudging them towards um, uh, too much sharing, um, companies should uh, adhere to their own published community guidelines, um, be clear about the age of their child using the service if there's a risk to a child on that service, um, and so forth. So, um, you know, it is new and exciting here, and um, I'm kind of, uh, maybe at the, at, the, at the end, we'll have a chance to kind of compare the, the various models that are in play, because I know a lot of um, legal brains around the world are, are struggling with exactly these, um, these, these dilemmas. Um, but I want to introduce our next um, speaker at this point. Uh, so I'm going to uh, introduce uh, Ariel Fox Johnson, who is um, senior um, senior counsel for privacy policy and privacy at Common Sense Media, and uh, her work seeks to enhance families' experiences with media and emerging technology to strengthen students' educational privacy and promote robust consumer protections in the online world. And um, she frequently advises policymakers, experts in the media on questions around children's privacy, and has indeed helped to develop laws on consumer privacy, student privacy, children's privacy, and the internet of things. And um, Ariel, your slides need to be turned on to present a view, and then I think you're good to go. Mm. Is that working? We'll move on if it's not. Okay, sorry guys, you don't get to see the beautiful slides. Um, they're mostly green and white with black <laughs> images. So I wanna talk about some state privacy laws, um, particularly state privacy laws in California that give uh, special rights to kids and teens and in some cases give rights to everyone. Um, the first one is the California Consumer Privacy Act. And that law was passed in 2018 and it gives a number of rights to families um, and kids. It's the first sort of broadly applicable consumer privacy law 
in the United States that doesn't apply only to children, but or only to like health data or banking data, but applies to everyone. Um, and it applies to a large number of companies um, doing business in California. If they have over certain revenues, if they um, process the data of over 50,000 you know, individuals, if they make money, um, over half of their money is made from um, processing data, collecting it, buying, selling it, um, then it applies to them. It also defines sort of personal data very broadly. It covers online and offline data. And that's important because as the other panelists have talked about, data is really collected in all different manners um, and combined from all different places nowadays. Um, and it gives a number of key rights to everyone. It gives you the right to know what information is being collected about you, though often, as Serge noted and others have noted, that right is um, in, in smaller text in a privacy policy. It gives you uh, the right to access your information and to, to download it and port it, and that's similar to the right we see in the GDPR. It gives you the right to have your information be deleted, though it only applies to information you yourself have provided to a company. And it gives you the right to say no to the sale of your data. Now for the special rights for minors are for children under 16, you don't have to say no to the sale of your data. Companies are supposed to get affirmative consent and you're supposed to opt in before they sell your data. So the default is you're protected. Now for kids under 13, it's supposed to be the parents who consent and for 13, 14, 15, it's supposed to be the teen who does the consenting on themselves. And we see this as sort of a, a training wheels situation, though I'm cognizant of other presenters' points that even adults don't really know what they're consenting to. Um, and I think it's important to also understand what, the, what does it mean to sell data. So in the CCPA, sale is broadly defined to include sharing data with a third party um, for monetary or other valuable consideration. So it is supposed to encompass the sorts of ad network, ID sharing that Serge discussed at the beginning. Uh, some companies have taken the position that that, that is not a sale of data and they're trying to come up with these complex workarounds and these contracts and try to get out of, of that definition. And there's in fact a pending ballot initiative partly driven by, by that. But the intent behind the law is that you're, be, you're able to say, no, stop selling my data. Or if you're a kid, the data is not sold unless you opt in. I also think it's important to mention um, Angela talked about how companies can avoid um, being covered by COPPA. They might say they don't have actual knowledge of kids or they're not directed to children. So we saw with like the kids toy website saying they're not directed to children. Um, under CCPA, uh, you have to treat someone as a kid if you have actual knowledge that they're a kid um, under 16, but actual knowledge includes willfully disregarding the age. So I think in many instances, um, for example, a toy website, you, you couldn't say you didn't have actual knowledge. You would at least be willfully disregarding and you would be therefore um, fall under that. Uh, for families who want to exercise CCPA rights, uh, Common Sense worked uh, with some others to set up a site. You can go to do not sell.org and you can make requests to companies. Now, um, in California, there's also another privacy law that applies to kids that I think is important in this remote learning context, and that is SOPIPA. It's um, the Student Online Personal Information Protection Act. It's the first law in the country to directly apply to ed tech providers who are collecting data from school children. And it, it's pretty strong. It says you can't sell students data. You can't use it to commercially profile them. You can't use it to target them with ads. Um, it only applies to ed tech providers that are you know, primarily marketed for and directed to kids. So as we know, there's a lot of general platform, general consumer devices now in schools, and there are you know, questions about whether it applies to them. Um, they're also, with all of these laws, issues with enforcement, they're primarily enforced by the Attorney General of California, um, which has limited resources, obviously, at this time. So for people who are interested in protecting their privacy, I think, uh, as others have said, it's in many instances a policy um, question at this point. The technology is there, but is there the will from the companies? You know, a handful of other states are also considering broad consumer privacy laws. There's, they've been introduced in Maryland, in New Jersey, um, New York, Texas has a task force, Oregon is looking at this. If you're interested in getting more privacy in your state, you know, one thing you can do is contact your state legislature. Another thing you can do is contact companies themselves. B 
because if they think consumers don't care about privacy, they're certainly not going to do anything. You know, you can use our do not sell.org tool to say, don't sell my information to a company. They might say, you don't live in California, so no. But they might say, okay, you know what? We're going to extend these rights to everyone. We're going to try to be good corporate citizens now that we think that consumers care about this. So those are sort of things you can do to try to expand protections. It's not perfect, but it's small steps you can take. Brilliant. Thank you, Ariel. Um, I think a question um, that has come in is um, echoing something that's going to be on many people's minds, which is when you're using an app or a device or a service, how does the company know if you're nine or 13 or 15 or 25? Um, and I think it's quite, I mean, how do they even know that you're a child? So I wonder if you could give us a sense of how things are developing there and are there technologies that can detect the age of the child? Sure. Um, and so, you know, in many instances, the company doesn't know, and it's basically a, a regulator might look at what kinds of content as, is, the, is the page putting out? Is it reasonable to expect that a child is your audience, is the child your intended audience? Mm -hmm. um, but in other sense, if they're really trying to figure out the age of the user, and we see this as a problem, not just in like children's content, but in people who want to look at adult content online or make certain purchases online, you know, COPPA gives a number of, of ways that parents can tell, that parents can give consent. But there are sort of also creative ways that companies are trying to see if they're dealing with children. Um, one that I've been reading about in the last couple of years will, involves taking a quick picture of your face or sort of like you use your face ID to log into a phone. It looks at your face, it does a scan, it sort of figures out what age you think it thinks you are. And then the privacy protective ones will delete everything and it'll just be like, you know, estimated 15 or estimated 11. Um, and there won't be any other information saved. So that's one way um, companies could tell. I've also heard of people developing um, ways to look at if I was going to download an app and they wanted to figure out how old I was, they would look at the other apps on my phone. And, you know, children would have different apps than adults would have, and it could make some sort of guess or estimate about your age. Um, none of these things are perfect, and there are ways to do them in more and less privacy protective ways. Um, I think as, as technology gets better, they can, they can certainly get better, but then there's then I know a couple of years ago, even working um, with facial recognition for, for kids has gotten, I think, better, especially in the mm -hmm. last couple of years. Uh, but as they get better at telling age, then we also need privacy protection sort of even more, even more than ever. Right. I mean, if I imagine um, my, my children taking a photo and, you know, offering that to the companies to set their age, that seems worrying to me. But then, of course, their images are out there already. And um, actually, our next speaker um, uh, has been researching the way in which parents themselves are putting images of their children um, out there and online. So um, there are some uh, questions, I think, for parents to uh, reflect upon as they, too, become uh, one of the means by which they um, uh, share data about their children. But um, let me introduce our next speaker who actually is, I think, going to not be despairing, but offer some practical uh, tips and suggestions also for the parents who are listening. So um, Stacey, Stacey Steinberg is the supervising attorney for the Gator Team Child Juvenile Law Clinic at the University of Florida. And she also serves as an associate professor for the Center on Children and Families. Her research really explores the intersection between the parent's right to share online and a child's own interest in privacy. And she's a leading scholar on what we're calling sharenting. So Stacey, thank you. Thank you so much. It's great to be here and to be on this panel. I'm gonna go ahead and get my screen shared. Cool. All right. So. Thank you guys very much for having me. And today I wanted to talk a little bit about how we as parents can continue to share or if we should continue to share despite the risks that it poses to our children. Um, I started this research because I recognize that while there are many dangers that come when we put ourselves online, many parents are still choosing to do so. Parents benefit from sharing on social media in a lot of different ways. They benefit by being connected with one another, by uh, being able to get advice, to share insights, but kids also benefit and need to have their privacy protected. 
I've noticed in my research when I've looked at this that it's not necessarily something that parents are doing maliciously. We, we know that they're not trying to take advantage of their kids' privacy, but parents act in a unique role. They serve as both the gatekeeper, they're the people charged with keeping their children's information private under rules like HIPAA and FERPA, um, but they're also the person who is opening the gate. They are the gatekeepers and they are the gate openers, and they haven't yet considered the importance of a child's digital footprint. So while I'm a law professor and I set off to do this work trying to find a legal solution to the conflict between a parent's right to share and a child's interest in privacy, I really walked away recognizing that this is more of something that can be looked at through a public health lens because well-informed parents are really best suited to make sharing decisions on behalf of their kids. So I got into this work because it found its genesis in self-reflection. Along with being a former prosecutor and child welfare attorney, I also have taken pictures for many years. And I've taken pictures of a lot of kids who have gone through horrible medical conditions. And they have asked me to take their pictures and they've shared their children's pictures uh, with wide audiences because they feel that there is a benefit to doing this. It benefits the family, it benefits the kids because it brings in community into the hospital rooms where they are. It helps raise awareness for important research, um, like when Humans of New York shared information about a prominent pediatric uh, cancer doctor, um, millions of dollars poured in to support important cancer research. So I recognize that there's, there's power in sharing, but there's also significant risks. We know that when parents share online, the information can end up in dangerous hands, and it might end up in hands that parents have no idea could possibly get. One of the most shocking statistics that I heard when I started this work was learning that the Australian e-safety commissioner who was studying, um, uh, who was looking and, and prosecuting people for child pornography found that 50% of images shared on pedophile image sharing sites had originated on family blogs and on family social media sites. These weren't pictures of children engaged in sexual acts or even naked pictures, but these were pictures that, uh, that predators and pedophiles had downloaded and were sharing with other people that had their interests. We also know that images can be stolen and they can be morphed. Many of us think of deep fakes when we think of adults and it comes up in politics often, the idea of deep fake videos or celebrities and deep fake videos of people doing things or appearing to do things that they're not. The reality is, is this can often happen with children as well and that is called morphed child pornography. Laws have not been updated in states to necessarily deal with the harm of more child pornography. Because even though children are harmed in the creation of the image, they're not, or even if children are not harmed in the creation of the image, they're certainly harmed by the image's distribution. Uh, luckily, the PROTECT Act, which is a federal statute, does uh, encompass these morphed child pornography images, but many state laws, including the state that I am in, um, has not updated its child pornography laws to take account for these images. So when I look at this issue, I spend a lot of time trying to identify what the risks are, are and research how prevalent the risks are. And when it comes to the tangible risks, like the ones that I just talked about, and the risks of data collection, which I, I don't have a slide for, but has obviously been presented by others here on this panel, and even the risk of data theft, um, those are what I consider the tangible harms. But I focus a lot on the intangible harms as well and how our kids feel about sharing and how it can affect their well-being in the future. Research does show that kids are sometimes embarrassed by what we post about them online, but research also does show that kids do feel that some of their parents are empowering them, and so maybe they're not quite as upset about it as some of the fear research might suggest. So we have research on both sides, that some kids are okay with it and some aren't. But what I think is critical is that we include our children in the decision-making process. We need to help them feel empowered by um, how we look at online sharing, because really this is their training wheels time when it comes to their own sharing when they become teenagers. We can't expect our kids to understand privacy or consent when they take on their own social media feeds unless we teach it, unless we talk about it, and unless we model it for them while they are young children. And so when we bring them into the conversation and we talk to them about what we're sharing and why we're sharing, we're helping to create that pattern. I think that sharing on social media um, also can have other risks that we need to think about, like it takes us outside of the moment, it makes us thinking more about our newsfeed. We also have to think about how um, it is that we want our kids to remember the memory. We want them to remember being there, not what the photograph looked like. 
I'm going to skip over the right to be forgotten, but let you know that you can always reach out to me if you'd like more information about this, but the idea that kids might have a right to have information posted about them deleted later on when they become adults. It's all about balance. On the same day that I was interviewed on this topic, my son was, was uh, on the news about winning a chess competition. And so what I tell parents is that we are the first generation to raise kids alongside social media, but our kids are also the first generation to grow up share. And so the number one rule is that we need to give ourselves some grace. A few quick tips that I'll run through quickly. Avoid using your child's full name. Consider nicknames. Remove your maiden name from your social media profile. Don't share birthday posts on the day of the birthday. You're giving away information. Don't share near naked or naked pictures. Ask your kids permission before posting and give them veto power. Be good social media role models. Consider how kids will feel now and years into the future about the information you're sharing. And review old posts at least once a year. Delete things that no longer serve your family. Further information, here's my email address and my website. And I really thank you for the opportunity to be on this panel. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stacey. I think it's, it's heartening to feel that there are things that parents can do. Um, and I think there's a very kind of practical um, pieces of advice that will ring true with the decisions and dilemmas that I know many parents are facing. Uh, I wonder, however, um, what about all the other people that know your child? Um, how do we kind of deal with uh, grandparents or um, the, the, the parents of the child's friend who put up the birthday party or the school even. Can you give us a sense of how, how, how can parents kind of protect their children's privacy more widely? I think that it's critical that sharing um, becomes part, a central part of child rearing discourse. So just like we're talking to our peers and our friends, uh, other teachers about how we choose to discipline our kids, how we choose to educate our kids, what we find has worked or not worked as far as mealtime, we need to be talking about our online sharing habits as well. And we need to be comfortable informing the people that we entrust our kids to about what those practices are. We would never send our child to school without telling them about an allergy that they had. We would never leave a child with a teacher without making sure that they knew about the child's behaviors. When we entrust other people with our kids, I think it's also critically important that we give them the information to help them protect their digital footprint in a way that we would want to protect it if we were in charge of that child ourselves at that moment. Yeah, thank you. Um, we are getting more questions coming in and we have um, 20, 25 minutes that um, uh, all the panelists can now um, be asked questions and address questions. So I do uh, invite everyone to keep um, posting your questions here. We are paying attention to them all and um, we'll try to ask as many as we can in, in the next little while. Um, maybe one question that several panelists may want to address is the idea that data collection can perhaps be beneficial. Um, apps might want to, or app developers uh, might want to um, collect the data and process it to improve the functioning of the app, to make it tailored better to the um, needs of the users, um, children or others. Um, how do we, uh, or, 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 you know, in, in some of those issues like ed tech, um, of course, collecting the data is designed to improve um, educational outcomes. So how do, how, do you think, how do you think about that kind of balance between collecting data for beneficial purposes, which might also be commercial, um, at, compared with locking it down and keeping children's data private? Does anyone want to offer a sense? Jeff? Yeah. I can start. Please. I mean, I think going back mm. to the legislation, we now have um, some very new thinking about how to govern all this. And part you're of the problem- You're a little, you're a little it, quiet, Jeff. Can you hear, can you hear me now? Uh, I said, uh, uh, it, we have some new ideas about how to govern all this. Mm -hmm. um, part of the problem is that in the system that's emerged, um, you know, you, you give up the information, it goes to this big, you know, uh, dark hole, and it's used for all kinds of, of different things, things that you never would have, have agreed to. Uh, under proposed legislation by uh, United States Senator Brown, which is really having a huge impact on the privacy debates in the United States, um, uh, only, you know, uh, there'd, there'd be a limit, there'd be real limits 
you'd only be able to use the data for the permissible use. So if it was to improve the health, the welfare, the educational facilities, that's okay. It would have to be monitored and evaluated, but it couldn't be used for anything else. So you're absolutely right. It's an ecology. It's not, it's all bad. It's all, it's all good, like anything in life, but there have to be limits. And the problem has been, there's been no limits because the industry's had a hold on the politics of the, the privacy debate uh, in the United States. Um, so we think that's a good way of uh, moving forward. And then finally, there's another movement, uh, which is global in nature, uh, of, around algorithmic accountability, transparency, and there's legislation there. Okay, you're going to say you're going to use it for one thing, but we have to make sure you really only use it for one thing. Mm -hmm. Right. Does anyone else want to um, come in on that point? Yes, Ariel. Uh, yeah, I would. I would sort of echo that. And I think we have to be careful when we're talking about collecting stuff for beneficial purposes, like beneficial to whom, right? Often mm -hmm. it's the companies and they're not thinking about the kids or putting their mm -hmm. um, interests at top of mind. And I know that's something like Sonia knows better than I do. The UK and, and Europe are looking into to changing more, but um, you know, in one of the student privacy laws in California, there's the ability to use anonymized and de-identified information to improve products, which will then also, you know, have, have benefits for students. But the children's privacy and their personal well-being is, is still protected in that way. And I think there's there's got to be ways of, of being able to use data, but also always keeping the, the children's interests sort of top of mind. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think for many parents and children, they it, it's a very kind of comprehensible approach that you're suggesting because people understand I had this app for this purpose, use the data to improve that purpose, but don't sell it to somebody I never heard of for some other, you know, for some other reason. I think that's, um, yeah. So I think, so we have um, a questioner from the audience um, uh, who I think is going to, um, ask a question that may be going back to what we just were discussing before about that question about age. Um, Humina, yes, can I call on you to ask your question? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sonia, for this opportunity. Thank you for all the panel members. Um, I'm an independent researcher and passionate about human rights, and now I'm doing a research in relation to children's rights. <laughs> so I'm very interested uh, about age verification. So my question to the panelists is, what do you know or which examples can you give me in relation of what work are companies doing uh, about age verification? Mm -hmm. I would appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Who would like to um, take that one um, first? Uh, maybe Serge would like to tell us something about the, 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 the technical challenges and prospects for age verification. I'm curious too, actually. That's actually not a, not, not an area that I know a whole lot about. I mean, okay. I, what I can tell you is from the apps that we've looked at, it's clear that you know most of the apps that are targeted at children are not you know obtaining verifiable parental consent. Um, mm -hmm. th that is known. Um, mm -hmm. In terms of what are the best methods to use, um, I don't have a strong opinion on that. I can just say mm -hmm. that you know what's happening. You know, it, it, what's happening doesn't appear to be um, for you know getting right. parental. And there's a lot that can be improved there. Right. I, I guess the question is whether there really are the technolo technological solutions available um, and the companies aren't using them, or are those solutions not really available at all? I think that might be. No, sure. Of course, the yeah. are, of course, those solutions are available. As I said at the, you know, the first question um, that, that I got, you know, we know how to do these things. It's just that most yeah. of them, you know, require some amount of investment and companies being willing to do them. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, so long as you know, screening children results in lower revenues for companies due to you know not being able to target ads as well, um, mm -hmm. they're going to be resistant to doing that, and that's mm -hmm. again why it's a policy problem. Mm. Okay, thank you. So um, Angela and then Jeff both want to come in on this, so I'll turn to Angela first. Thank you. Yeah, I was just going to give an example. I'm just, companies vary. Some don't ask for age at all. A lot of them do ask you to put your date of birth. And this is not very effective at all. We know that because especially if it's a service that the kids want to use and they know they have to be 13, they have every incentive to lie. And, and a good example of this is TikTok where uh, you, you know, if a kid 
in the US puts in an age under 13 and they, they will only be able to use the service to create a video they can't share with anyone. So, and they can also just immediately go back and put a different birth date in and get onto the service. Mm -hmm. And then we found out that TikTok actually knows or it, it has its own way of using some of these methods you've talked about, facial recognition and, and inferences and um, algorithms uh, to, to classify ages. And they found that according to New York Times, a third of their users are under the age 14 or 18 million of their users. And they're not supposed to be under on it if they're under 13, at least in the United States. So they they know this, or they have a pretty good idea who the kids are. I mean, you can see a lot of times there's a kid there in the video, um, but they don't use that information to uh, either uh, to kick the people off the service or to um, you know protect their information in any way. So I think it's really uh, you know really goes back to this: we want the companies, we've got to pressure the companies to be more responsible because otherwise they just, just in their economic interest not to protect children. So, so, so Jeff, we've heard that um, the technological solutions are available um, from Angela, that the companies are not using them. Um, well, that, we well, no, them? I don't think that's true. I mean, look, we think the companies okay. are using them. I mean, following up with what Angela, because her organization, our organization actually worked together on this. Um, hi. Well, so, look, we've all we've thought for a number of years that the uh, industry has, in fact, knows that there's a child in the audience, um, but both in terms of their measurement system, which is in, 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 in significantly involved. This is on a global basis, not just in the United States. But in the last several years, the, 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 the work they've done on child safety to identify children in the audience, our set of systems, and then the brand safety system. Systems. The brand safety systems are incredibly important, and part of them are designed to identify children and protect the brands from um, 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 targeting, tar uh, uh, transmitting content in ways to children that would place them in some kind of um, uh, jeopardy in terms of their reputation. Now, what Angela just talked about is a whistleblower first called us and our colleague campaign for commercial free childhood and told us about this internal system and indeed this internal system comes out of the brand safety system of, of TikTok. they know how many children are on are on there so they they, they how they are using it and whether or not they're using it for monetization we have given that information to the federal trade commission and the department of even though it's hard for me to say yes we've given it to the bill Barr department of justice to invest to investigate what exactly are they using this system in addition recently there was a settlement a very important settlement involving children's apps and as part of the settlement uh, the companies have in, in essence agreed to institute measures to identify when children use an app or in the app which to me illustrated the industry knows that these solutions are there so yes the technological and business applications identifying children as part of the marketplace are there and the problem has been that the advocates and the parents can't force the companies to uh, disclose which is why we want the governments uh, to come in and and just frankly, and this is a great, this shows you how important privacy is because you could get the data protection commissioners of the UK and, and Europe to force the companies to turn over all of this data. What exactly are they collecting on young people in terms of brand safety metrics? How's that being used? What does it all mean? Yeah, thank you. Uh, Humina, thank you so much for your um, question and I hope the uh, answers were um, helpful. Uh, there's another question just come in that I have to say is one that uh, puzzles me as well. So um, Serge described the way in which the data comes in through um, a device or an app and then it kind of goes on a journey to the other, the other data brokers and uh, and so forth. Um, it feels to me like we're talking very much about what parents need to understand or know about the app they see their child using and whether they can get TikTok to, um, you know, a, provide appropriate age settings or privacy settings. But what 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 do we do? What can we do about that longer journey that the data goes on and the way in which it gets aggregated and profiled downstream, as it were, um, resulting in other kinds of um, uh, marketing. Is there any role for parents there or is that really just now down to the regulators? And what, what happens to, to the data subjects rights there? I, I, I don't know if Ariel, if you want to um, come in on whether, whether parents can exercise any kind of data rights um, in relation to those big 
profilers and aggregators? I mean, if you can identify who the profilers yeah. and aggregators are, which as right. <laughs> discussed right. is uh, stumbling yeah. block number one. Um, yeah. But if you can identify who they are, uh, yeah. depending on where you live, you could uh, ask them, um, if you're in California, certainly, then you could ask them what data yeah. do they have about you, yeah. um, yeah. or if you're in Europe. And I also, it's, there's some sort of uh, education questions coming in, I don't know if we'll answer those later, but also under, under mm -hmm. a, a federal education privacy, under FERPA, then mm -hmm. you have a right as a parent to know what sort of educational data is, is being collected mm -hmm. about your children. Mm -hmm. So there are ways, um, but I think when we're talking about the big data aggregators, it's, it's almost impossible for, for people to find out where this stuff has been, which is why a lot of the focus is, mm -hmm. as you're hearing us talk about, just like using the data for that one app or that one mm -hmm. purpose or that one company, because once mm -hmm. it kind of gets out there, Mm -hmm. It's almost Im impossible to to trace or follow or or get mm -hmm. back. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, and as you said, the the California Act gives parents or children or everybody the chance to get back the data that they provided, but not the data that is inferred about them. So, two yes, yeah, there's a slight distinction. Under California, you have the right to know about all the data a company has about you, including that ah. they've gotten from another source. Mm -hmm. In terms of your rights to delete data, you can mm -hmm. only have them delete data that you have given them. It's not <laughs> okay. the right to be right. forgotten in, in Europe. Okay, so maybe we can come to um, uh, back to Stacy and the idea of the right to be forgotten. I know that when I do interviews with parents and children, they really, really believe it somehow when they reach the age of 18, it should all be wiped and they get to start over. And that's a very kind of gut reaction I think they have. But Stacy, is there any prospect of this happening? So I kind of geek out over this question because it's my favorite thing to talk about is the right to be forgotten. Um, for those on the call that don't know, the right to be forgotten is a principle that um, does that is not really in existence in the United States, but is in existence in Europe that says that as time passes, the value of certain information dissipates and that people have a right to reclaim their reputation and their name. And so in Europe and in, in some countries, what I understand happens is that if a person sees something in a Google search result that is unfavorable to them, and they can make the argument that that information is not accurate or even more so no longer relevant to who they are right now. It doesn't necessarily even have to be not accurate if it's not reflective of them. They can have the inf they can they have a right to have the information taken off the Google search result. But doesn't mean the article itself where the information is posted goes away, but that the link between that person's name and the Google search result is in essence broken. Now, I have argued um, that in, in, my, in my work that perhaps what the United States can do to kind of cure the issue between a parent's right to share and a child's right to privacy is it can recognize that while when children are young, information that parents are sharing about their children is speech and, and our free speech protections are the reason why the right to be forgotten isn't working here in the United States or it hasn't taken root. But while when parents are, are speaking about their kids and their kids are young, that information is speech. But that over time, the value of that speech dissipates and instead has to make way for the competing interest of privacy that the child has. And so my argument is that when kids get older, that that information is no longer that parents expressive speech, but is instead data that has been collected about the child. And so therefore, children should have a right to be forgotten regarding the information that was shared during your childhood. Um, I don't know of anyone else making that specific argument in the States. Uh, I guess uh, Jeff's making that argument. I would love to or wants to comment about it, but, um, but that's just something that I really like to think about. And, and um, you know, it's more mental gymnastics for me than anything else right now. So, so that's kind of the overview of where we're at. I think, I think the entire issue is mental gymnastics for all of us, actually. So um, we, are, we are all struggling to understand this. Uh, Jeff, did you want to come in on? No, just that Senator Markey, as, as, who is really the country's foremost privacy champion in Congress, and he works with Republicans uh, mm -hmm. to get COPPA through and to this, mm -hmm. uh, the bill that we hope will pass in the next Congress, bipartisan bill, um, to strengthen children and teen privacy. He, has, he calls it the eraser button. 
uh, mm-hmm. which is in essence the right to be forgotten for young people. I think it's under 15 and under now because of a compromise. But, but, but in fact, that legislation has now been around for two years and it, it will move through and we'll have a right to be forgotten kind of framework in the United States eventually for young people. I think it's critical that the, any sort of right to be forgotten doesn't focus on what the child themselves puts out on the internet about themselves, mm-hmm. but instead mm-hmm. focuses on what others put out about themselves, about those mm-hmm. kids online. And so really my focus has been more on other people sharing about kids as opposed to kids sharing themselves. Right. And I think that brings us also back to the question that I think um, Ariel made about schools and schools are a huge way of ch- data being collected about children and indeed shared about children, even though I know parents would like to want to trust the school. So Ariel, I don't know if you wanted to um, add on or perhaps what, what, what hopes you see for the FIPA law when it really takes hold. Um. Well, I was going to say, we, we also, we did get passed in California, the eraser button provisions mm-hmm. uh, from, from Senator Markey's because he's, as Jeff has said, he's been trying to pass this stuff for years in Congress, decades. Mm-hmm. Um, got passed in California for, for kids under 18, but it, again, and it's limited to what the kid themselves posts. Mm-hmm. Um, and when we got it passed, not every company would allow you to delete things you posted. And, and now most upstanding companies will at least like allow you to sort of delete it from from public view Mm -hmm. um and i think i'm i think common at common sense we're very supportive of of stacy's notion that parents should have some say in what their or kids should have some say in what their parents post um Mm -hmm. though i would probably Mm -hmm. encourage uh kids and parents to talk about what is appropriate and to delete it as a faster mechanism than i you know seeking legal Mm -hmm. resource recourse Mm -hmm. um but I'm um, yeah no thank you I'm, I'm interested that nobody um has really talked about questions of security and data breaches but I know that um over here we have the kind of headlines frequently that even when the systems are you know designed they're not designed well enough really to hold kids data securely and um we have had a question about um sharing um sharing data or storing data in the cloud how secure is that you know how much should we be kind of locking down our devices and is that something parents could do take more do more about perhaps i don't know if anyone wants to <laughs> okay jeff well you know i was thinking the previous question <clears throat> i mean what can parents do and this is impossible to do but you can look at the apps that you have and your kid has mm. and coca-cola mcdonald's mm. the mm. music companies all those mm. companies are the phone provider you have, all those companies through their apps are transmitting data uh, about your kids and about uh, about you. And, and mm-hmm. you know, and it's a huge system that's put, been put mm-hmm. into effect. So Coca-Cola, look, almost every, co- if you're going to be in business today, you're a data broker. Coca-Cola and McDonald's and, mm-hmm. and Honda, they're all data brokers. They have mm-hmm. huge internal data operations. Apps are a new way for them to collect data Directly, and then there's an outs, outside system. So it's it's you know it's 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 mind-boggling uh, to to even think about. And we I do want to talk about data security, but I also want to talk about the pandemic because what mm-hmm. the what the pandemic has done is mm-hmm. it's, it's accelerated the data collection of young of young people's information across mm-hmm. all these spheres, and mm-hmm. you know, including streaming video and gaming. And what's happened, according to the industry, is that they ha- have reached a level of maturity in terms of data collection and audience that they did not expect to see for three or four years. So right. now you have children even more mm-hmm. at risk because mm-hmm. all this information, including now their mm-hmm. school information, which is why mm-hmm. a number of us raised alarm a few weeks ago, that mm-hmm. on these educational sites, kids were mm-hmm. seeing at junk food advertising and their data mm-hmm. was being collected because the schools don't have any control anymore given what, what having to do online learning. So this really, the, the pandemic really underscores the need for us to look at this whole issue comprehensively. Mm-hmm. And if we can come up with global standards, that would be very, very important. 
I, I think we would all be very excited about that. I think Angela wanted to um, quickly say something about security before we wrap up. Yeah, and as I mentioned in my talk, the, the law says you're supposed to have, provide reasonable data security and that you're not supposed to retain data longer than is necessary for the intended purpose. Well, so the more data that's collected, the more possibilities there are for breaches. And yet mm. this is something that the FTC, is, as far as I know, is only uh, prosecuted in a small number of cases, a bit, one being the VTech, which was a toy mm. company. <laughs> yeah. um, but, but, you know, Jeff is right. They're collecting more and more data. And, and another one we looked at, we complained about, but the FTC hasn't had to do with the Amazon Alexa speakers that were specifically designed for children, and their default is that they save every, every they record everything that the child says, or after they were, use the wake word, and then they keep those messages in the cloud forever unless the parents go to the trouble of deleting it. And that's, mm -hmm. you know, it's not easy. They make it really hard for you to figure out how to do that, which is an example of what we call nudging or the design, mm -hmm. persuasive design, which I think is another way of addressing some of these problems is that uh, there have to be the defaults that are privacy friendly and they have to make it when you want to do something. You shouldn't, they shouldn't put the burden on the parents and it should make it easier for parents when they need to intervene. Right. Right. And, and, and insofar as the burden is on parents, I think, you know, there will be some parents who are better positioned to make those complaints and make those requests. And some parents won't have that, that capacity. So there are some um, inequalities there. Um, I'm really sorry to say that our time is up and Pam has popped back up. I know to, to Do we thank our event. moderator, Sonia Livingston, for a fabulous job. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, Jeff. I, um, I didn't give everyone a kind of final word because I really wanted to prioritize the questions that were coming in and there have been some great questions. So I thank the panelists and the audience and Pam, well, if, I hand if, back if, to you. If you'd like to, to give a final word, Sonia, please do so. <laughs> And oh, I'm, happy I'm, I'm all up for the idea of um, a global collaboration to bring about change because I think um, parents and children everywhere really, and, and teachers actually, schools, so many folks are really kind of dismayed at the seeming takeover um, of their data and their lives. So I think there's a lot of scope for action. I really hope we get to see it. And hopefully you'll share that. <laughs> and so uh, on that note, um, thank you so much, uh, Sonia and uh, Angela, Serge, Stacy, Ariel, and Jeff for an enlightening, fascinating, and important conversation. And thank you to our attendees for your participation and wonderful questions. We hope that you can use what you've learned today to work toward establishing safe and secure online practices for your family. To continue learning about this topic, be sure to visit our website where we will post additional insights in the coming days. We will also be posting a YouTube video of today's workshop, which we encourage you to share with your fellow parents, teachers, clinicians, researchers, and friends. For more from Children and Screens, please follow us on social media at the account shown on your screen. Our discussions about digital media use and children's well-being will continue throughout the rest of the year. Next Wednesday, October 7th at noon EDT, we will be discussing persuasive design, a set of sophisticated tactics used by technologists to manipulate users' behavior and keep them glued to their screens. Panelists will explain how and why these techniques work and will outline strategies to mitigate their efforts. The following Wednesday, our workshop will cover the topic of screens and differently abled students during COVID-19. When you leave the workshop, you'll uh, see a link to the, a short survey. Please click on the link and let us know uh, what you thought of today's webinar. Thanks again and everyone stay safe and well.